welcome back to Women Making Moves, where we celebrate the moves that women are making. My name is Amy Pons. I'm a master certified life coach and a soul healer. I'm joined today with Leslie Vinets. Leslie Vinets is a sales-led GTM consultant. Go to market for those who don't know. She is a three times head of sales, award-winning sales expert, and the founder of the sales-led GTM agency and revenue revelry. Leslie uses her expertise to help teams talk with, with, their prospects instead of at them. Leslie is an active content creator with over 60,000 followers. Leslie co-authored the book, Heels to Deals, How Women Are Dominating in B2B Sales. Her next book, Earn the Right, is scheduled to be published in late 2024. She's passionate about transforming sales into an inclusive, respected profession. Leslie, welcome. Oh, Amy, I just could not be more excited to be having this conversation with you. I... Couldn't wait. I know you saw my note on LinkedIn. I was like, I can't wait to bring this up on Wednesday. What a person came to you in a DM, I assume. And I had something similar recently, whereas somebody got into my DMs and was like, to get my attention, they were like, did you hear who just died recently? I was like, what's happening? And it was like a pitch. I was like, what? 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 And so it resonated like when you posted this week, or maybe it was last week about someone coming to you off the wall. It's like, what's happening? Yes. Is it between attention grabbing and like startling or jarring you? What? Yes. Leaving me utterly baffled and searching for the Marcus spam button. So it made me laugh because I was like, oh, Leslie gets them too. Good. Okay. It's not just me. All right. So we're going to get into all the things and especially what Leslie's here and the expertise that she has. And like, I appreciate what they're trying to do and it doesn't land. So they missed the mark, which is what you talk about and what your expertise is in. So Leslie... What are you up to this week? What are you excited about? So I went to a new yoga studio on Monday and I loved it. And they gave me a whole week for free. I can go as many times as I want. So I'm going to go back again on Friday and Saturday. So I'm very excited about that because on my in list for 2024 was develop a yoga practice. I also had dinner last night with a LinkedIn friend, Ashley Coghill. So that was really like a fill my cup. And I'm reconnecting with a close friend tomorrow. And Chicago just got a St. Regis Hotel. So we're going to get like dressed up and do like a red lip and go have a like fancy glass of something at the bar at the St. Regis. So like so many things I'm excited about this week. Lots of connection. Oh, that's beautiful. And I'm going to see you in person the next week. I know. I I chuckle because Leslie and I went to a a fairway dinner uh, that we all met in Chicago in December. And we were sitting across from each other. And when I heard your name, I was like, you're on my podcast coming up. And you're like, we are like, what? We didn't. It's just funny how like you meet online or you meet through the Aaron Gallagher. And, you know, when you actually see each other person, it's like, oh, you're a fairway lady. Got it. We it vibe. was amazing. It was a moment I was like, wait, like a- Amy Pond's a- Amy, like from lip. Oh my gosh. Well, hello, best friend. <laughs> hello. Hello. Here we are. It's funny you say about like what you're doing because you don't live downtown, right? I do. I live in the oh, South. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't realize that. Okay. I have been finding myself going to the city so much for either events, networking. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is not the norm for me. So I'm like, I'm sitting with that. It's like, hmm, interesting. Okay. Well, leaving my house isn't the norm for me. So kind of the same. I didn't know that St. Regis was coming to Chicago. That's incredible. No, so. it just opened in November. I'll report back when we see each okay. other in person. Okay. Okay. Thank please you. do. This week, next week, all good things, all connection. What about the next couple months? What What moves are you excited to be making right now overall? Ooh, okay. I think the thing I'm most excited about, oh, twofold. I have so many. Yep. Big, yeah, I know. I have I have big aspirations um, and celebrations I know are coming my way this year. Uh, I'm in the middle of a rebrand for my business. So that's very exciting. I uh, am going with just these like really bright feminine colors. And that's something that even two years ago, I would not have had the confidence to do. So I'm like, just excited to like root more into me being the business. And like, if you want to hire me, you get all of me vibes. So that's exciting. I also have two other side projects. I don't like to call them side hustles. I prefer to call them passion projects. So in addition to my consulting business, I also have a Patreon book club 
And I also have a events brand called Revenue Revelry. So I'm excited about the book club. We met last night. The book was Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. 10 out of 10, highly recommend. It was so powerful and so moving. And the book club discussions are this like moment that fills my cup once a month. And we get so caught up in the sales space with like, it has to scale, scale, scale growth. And book club has taught me for something to matter. It doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to scale and it doesn't have to be focused on growth. Like it can have tremendous impact and just be like small and intimate and exactly what it is. And then the last thing, Revenue Revelry, which I was talking to to you about before we went live, is my events brand, which I got really frustrated like two years ago when events started coming back after the pandemic, that every event for sales, for B2B sales, just felt like either kind of bro-y or boring, like we're in a windowless conference room, or frankly, didn't feel particularly safe because it was like, we're just going to meet and get hammered. And because the industry is predominantly male, of course, those events were predominantly male. And so I, instead of waiting for somebody else to create the type of events that I wanted, I just decided to do it myself. That's incredible. What's it called? What's it about? Yeah. Yeah. So the next event that we're having is in Chicago. It's in April, April 16th at this cute venue called the Joinery, which is like Wicker Park, Logan Square. And it is for full cycle sellers because so many people, like not just people that maybe would perceive themselves as salespeople, but like business owners like me, you know, folks that are running their own agency, folks that are trying to launch their own passion projects need to figure out how to both like get the attention of the people that will spend money with them. And then also have those conversations in a way like makes it meaningful to the buyer, to the recipient of the conversation. And of course, lands and revenue. So that's the theme. And I'm just, I'm hosting it with this woman called Jen Allen. She's like smart and thoughtful and dynamic and just brings the energy. So also just such a privilege to get to create the space for other people and then to get to do it in collaboration with this woman who I just admire. That's pretty amazing. My antenna are just peaking right now. So one of the amazing things that drew me to you months ago, many months ago, was that you talk about broy, especially when we talk about sales and my business turns one this week. And I'm so elated about that. And what I found in my first year is that so many women that I resonate with, we are we are being called so strongly to usher back in the divine feminine, mm-hmm. which is feeling, trusting, flowing, believing, knowing. And if nothing that I just said lands with you, it's the women's intuition. And for a long time, especially over the past hundred years, but like the divine feminine has been exiled for thousands of years. And we've been skewed in the masculine, which is the order, structure, power, hierarchy, the doing. And that's started to become, it's become toxic. It has been for a long time to where humans, not just women, humanity is struggling to figure out, well, I want to feel things again. (laughs) And I think a lot of people right now are waking up to the fact that like, I want to feel again. Oh, by the way, we're in this day to day where that's not necessarily safe or I don't know how to do it without causing mayhem to those who are really, really grounded in the power structure, hierarchy, et cetera. The thing I love that resonated with me when you're talking about this event and the work that you do is feeling into knowing and trusting what you're here to do Mm. as a human and because what we do, women, (laughs) trusting and flowing into what you're here to do as a woman and getting excited about when you do land that client and you're, you're making revenue. How would you talk about feeling into the divine feminine and celebrating the how or the when, which is when you're so hell bent on the how and the when and the what you take yourself out of the divine feminine. So Mm. my question to you is how do we flow, feel, trust, believe, and take aligned action to get the money and further be excited about the money? Yeah. It's such a valid question because there, there can be this like default of feeling a disconnect between Mm -hmm. the two first 
congratulations on your one year anniversary. Thank you. It's so <laughs> exciting. Yay. The first thing I thought of when you, when you were just talking, Amy, was that my mantra for this year, I picked two of them because I couldn't decide on one and why choose. One is inner knowing. And the other is harvest, harvest in the context of like abundance, welcoming abundance. Yeah. And when I think about inner knowing in sales, specifically women in sales, when something feels icky, listen to it and stop doing it because that is not meant for you. That's not the path that's going to attract the type of clients that bring the type of revenue that create a durable business model. The caveat though, is that you do need to get uncomfortable, but I think there's a line, right? Like you need to push a little bit of out, like push against your boundaries a little bit because it, it can be uncomfortable to cold call a stranger. It can be uncomfortable to, you know, have that feeling of interrupting somebody's day with an email that they didn't ask for a LinkedIn message they didn't ask for. So it's about bridging that gap between being willing to push against your boundaries and be a little bit uncomfortable. But when it starts feeling icky, listen to that intuition because that, that means that you're going in a direction that doesn't serve you. Yes. And what I love about that is that what, that's what we do in coaching. Meaning when something uncomfortable comes up for you, it's entered your consciousness and it's inviting you to sit with it and see what that's about. It's an, it's an invitation to go in. So I like what you're saying because I, I get it. It's like, it's like pulling the thread of the discomfort and seeing like discerning, will it not serve you or is it aligned for you? And it's an invitation of walking toward your highest self or getting out of your comfort zone, which is needed sometimes when you're wanting to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, something that's really interesting about selling B2B sales is that on average, women, both as individual contributors and as sales leaders outperform men by four to 8%, depending on what data set you look at. So even in the midst of an industry that isn't usually safe for women or, or sort of women feel like another, even fighting against that. And even knowing that the, the processes and frameworks and training were made like by white men for white men to sell to white men. And so we are in the middle of like a space that wasn't made for us and we are still winning and not just winning, we are winning at higher rates than men are. And when we think about leaning into our women's intuition, leaning into the divine feminine, you know what tends to come very easily for women? Curiosity, mm -hmm. a desire to help without expecting something immediately in return, mm -hmm. empathy, and when I look at sales copy and folks, I look at a lot of sales copy. When I look at sales copy that creates the best conversations that lead to revenue, it is copy that centers the reader. Mm -hmm. It is copy that's like genuinely curious, that is sent by somebody who clearly took the time before they hit send or pick up the phone or whatever it is to ask themselves, how can I make this matter? to the person that's going to be in the receiving end of a message or the methodology that I teach is earn the right. So to ask yourself, like, what have I done to be curious or to share an insight or to, to lead with something of value to this person that earns the right to interrupt their day? Mm. That's interesting the way that you put that, because I'd love your thoughts in real time on me as a business owner. Historically, I would tell you that I don't sell. But then I'm like, is that true? Because everything I put out there on my social platforms or in daily conversation, I'm unabashedly, unapologetically me. And I talk about my energy work. I talk about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. I talk about, I'm not necessarily talking about results or outcomes. I talk about what I lead in my business and naturally folks self-select and come find me. Would you call that selling? I would call that demand generation. 
which is just like a sales and marketing term for creating awareness and attracting folks to your brand. And in this case, you are the brand. But yeah, it it falls under the sales bucket, right? And I think so often our conception of sales is wrapped up in the picture of the old like car salesperson or like the terrible movies from the 80s and 90s that were like smile and dial. Like if you don't get a Cadillac, you get fired, right? And again, like those were archetypes of the salesperson that were created by white men for white men to sell to white men. Yeah, like, yeah. That was never us. It was never meant for us. And the way that women are often most successful in selling or in, in your example, like creating that demand, creating that lead funnel is by sharing knowledge, like ungatekeeping knowledge mm. and sharing really like with that open palm instead of the closed fist so that people can find us. Right. Because the thing about me as a coach, if you still depend on me after we end a coaching session, I haven't done my job. I'm drawing out the magic and the know-how in you that has been trained and conditioned out of us so that we're on un- gatekeeping, on gatekeeping knowledge, because correct me if I'm wrong in understanding this. It's like the, the way that the, the white man created sales. It's like, oh, you need me. You can't live without me. <laughs> it's like the codependency. That's not what we're doing. We want you to stand on your own flat footed in your power. And we help extract that that's already in you. Yeah. Spot on. I think historically sales has been about control. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I know this because I have been taught this and I have seen it written in countless books and I have heard the sales experts say it. And there's an evolution happening. And this applies to all salespeople, regardless of gender identity, that our buyers, our prospects they're not game for control. Like they expect to be able to go to a website and watch a demo or like understand your pricing or at the very least have a sample of your work, which is LinkedIn's a great way to show a sample of like your work and who you are. Like our buyers are no longer putting up with sellers keeping just a death grip of control on the sales process. Like it is, I think that that buying and selling process is more collaborative than it's ever been before. So folks that default to collaboration, folks that default to co-creating and, Mm -hmm. and viewing, I think the process of buying and selling is like a win-win where historically it was like, I win and you lose. Oh, Leslie. So interesting that you say that and that you brought up the car dealership example earlier. When I was in college, I worked as the front room receptionist at a car dealership. And this whole vibe and that we've been skewed in the masculine for especially the past hundred years, it's become toxic because it's about one human gaining power over another human. And I genuinely saw this in the car dealership world where I was delivering a message to the tower, we called it, which by the way, wow, as I say that, it was the tower of the managers at the car dealership and the sales folks, mostly men, I would hear things like, oh, watch this, I'm going to get them. Or like they would pretend to take an offer from like the buyer up to the tower and the two guys would like shoot the breeze for a minute and be like, all right, they would like draw pictures. They wouldn't actually have a conversation about a negotiation or like what would actually be true. They would just shoot the breeze for a minute and go back and be like, yeah, my boss said I can't do that. It was like, it was all Mm -hmm. built on lies and power and the structure and the buyer would have no choice to, but to like either walk or it was this game. They literally thought it was a, they thought of it as a game to play with someone's money. Yeah. With somebody's financial security. Yeah. It was so interesting. We had this special event one time. And again, I wasn't a salesperson. I was a receptionist, but we were so busy at this special event. I took on this family that was looking for, to buy a vehicle. And they were like, hey, me, can you help out and just like show them around and show them vehicles? I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I did. We had a bond in that moment. They were telling me what they needed the car for, uh, et cetera. 
And <laughs> the management that day regretted making me a salesperson for that day because they made zero money. I would go up and I would say, this is how much they can afford. And they were like, well, get more out of them. I was like, no. And I would just, re- I refused to do that. And I sold cars that day, but for what the people could afford, not what mm. wanted me to do. So they were like, you'll never sell a car again. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll go back to my reception job. Okay. But I'd counter that if you had been given time in a year, you would have been the top performing executive because all of those people, when it was the right time for them to buy a car, they'd come to you because they feel like they could trust you. And right now, like depending on the data set you look at, we're seeing that like 57 to like 80 something percent of sales start with referrals or word of mouth or reading testimonials. So you better believe that Mm -hmm. anytime somebody in the network of those people that you listened to and you took time to understand talked about buying a car, they would say your name. So it's like, sure, I get it. Low pressure sales do not work short term, period. They don't because you're not pressuring people into making a decision that might not be in their best interest. But long term, it's a play that has like multi-fold returns. Speaking of numbers, I'm going to go to a post that you made actually today, and I'm going to read a little bit of it and I have a question. So the 80-20 rule is alive and well in sales. Mm -hmm. A 2023 Pavilion benchmark report found that 23% of reps are contributing 83% of revenue. What do they know that you don't? They know who their ICP is. And you probably just mumbled to yourself, whatever, Leslie, I know my ICP. If you're in the 77% of reps contributing only 17% of revenue, respectfully, bestie, no, you don't. Want to win more in 2024? Dial in your ICP. <laughs> Leslie, what's the ICP? Um, So an ICP is your ideal customer profile. But here's what business owners, founders, sellers often get wrong, is that they think of their ICP as anybody who could potentially buy from them. That is certainly like a customer bubble, but you're missing ideal. And so then some people will go one layer deeper and they'll think, well, who is most likely to buy from me? And maybe most likely to buy from me at a fair price point, like as soon as possible. And then you kind of start getting ideal, but it's still this huge bubble And what I teach and what I argue is that in order to create messaging that is relevant, that is valuable, messaging that matters to the person reading it, you have to build in more layers to your ideal customer profile. So you can't stop at, we sell to finance executives in, you know, list of four industries in North America, because then you'll find yourself trying to create messaging that appeals to all of them which means it's not meant for any of them. And that works for for like marketing messaging. But sellers, our responsibility is one-to-one communication. Our responsibility is to make people feel heard, to seek that deep understanding. And I'm not saying that every single email that you make needs to be like one-to-one, but I would challenge you to build enough layering into your ideal customer profile or your territory, whatever terminology you're using, that you feel really confident that the conversation you're looking to have with somebody matters to them. Is there a difference when you say making sure it matters to them? Is there something you would lead with depending on which energy you're feeling in the moment? Is, does that because because certainly, I mean, the no person, no one person is the same. And so yeah. you would a little bit message, but and like the way you sense right away how someone's vibing with you. How would you give that advice in real time so so that you can like tailor it so it does matter? So caveats. First, my expertise is B2B, business to business, not B2C consumer facing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. You are selling something consumer facing. Sense check this advice, it may not be meant for you. Two, I'm going to answer that question the opposite way. I'm going to share an example of something that people think they are doing right, 
But then when you put yourself in the recipient's shoes, feels really bad. And it's disingenuous personalization. So that might sound like, hi, Amy, congrats on your one-year anniversary. Anyway, my widget that I sell is. Yes. Right? Yes. I get it a lot that's like, congrats on like your LinkedIn editorial top voice badge, Leslie. I wanted to talk to you about buying outsourced HR technology. And I'm like, what? Why? What? Like in, what? Like in what world are those two ideas related? And where it really goes wrong is when people are doing like social selling. And I just used air quotes there, folks, because the first message usually is something like, hey, I've been following your content for a while, like congrats on your LinkedIn badge, like everything you say is so valuable. You're really helping me out a lot. So me, the recipient, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so nice. I've like really made a difference. And so I hit accept on that message to connect. Two seconds later, there's a message right back in my inbox that is a generic sales pitch. So not only... Did you lead with something that was disingenuous, which told me that you don't actually care about me. You care about checking the box that some leader or creator told you you're supposed to check with personalization. Like not only did you tell on yourself that you don't really care by using disingenuous personalization, you also hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. So I like, I think that is something I see a lot of people struggle with because they they want to personalize either because they've read somewhere that they should or like that just sort of intuitively feels like something they should do so they google like how to personalize and they fall into this trap of disingenuous personalization so i'd say that's one thing the other thing that i would tell folks to avoid doing is starting any of their messaging with a false platitude like Hope you're well because you are communicating with a total stranger and you may or may not hope they're well, but it brings no value to the table for them. Like you've not given them anything. You've only done that for yourself to make you feel better. You don't even know the baseline of what well is for, for them. them. Yeah. This is fascinating to me because for a while now I've been noodling, getting an assistant of some sort. And it's fascinating to me how I'm inundated with proactive VA services. Yeah. Tell me what someone can do, Leslie. <laughs> I can't tell you how floored I would be. Here's what I want. <laughs> and if anybody's listening to this, this is your getting their answers to the test here. If someone came to me and said, Amy, I've been following your content here's what I love the most. And then they go into something specific as it relates to what's landed for them. And maybe what they've been able to do is leverage that something I've said or done or that they've seen, they've leveraged in their day-to-day -day practice. And oh, by the way, I'd love to be part of your work because it resonates with me so deeply. And here's why. And then lastly, oh, by the way, if you're by chance in the market for an assistant, like, and keep me in mind in the future. That's what I'm looking for. That would be such a powerful message. You know what I think happens, Amy, is that folks feel like, not to use like a super corporate jargon, but like they feel like they have to boil the ocean. Mm. They've set this goal for themselves or somebody has given them this quota that they have to hit. And there's just this immediate pressure where they're like, oh my gosh, I have these thousand accounts and I need to contact all of them. And it is, it's like a false narrative and kind of a false sense of urgency that you just need to get in touch with all of these people as quickly as possible. And so we get this very generic messaging as a result. When if even one of the probably 150 people that have sent me a message about how bad they think my website is, instead sent a message that was like, hey, based on my research, it looks like you primarily use your socials to drive revenue, not your website. Even though your website isn't a primary lead source for you, 
I can recommend three small changes that will help it work better in tandem with your socials. I'd be like, say more. Instead, every message I get is like either a 17 bullet point message of all the things they can do with the website, or it's just like your website's really bad. You should fix it. I'll do that for you. I'm like, well, again, now you've hurt my feelings. I quite like my website too. That's also not a priority for me, which you so clearly could have understood if you would have either A, done a little bit of research or B, just asked me a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many great pieces of advice and they're not that hard. It just takes more time, which again, I don't think a lot of people are willing to put in right now because of that higher pressure, no matter where it's coming from, it's coming from somewhere. So it feels like Leslie, you're creating a new way, a new way to think about selling. Is that fair to say in the B2B space? Yes, that is fair to say. You're creating a paradigm shift for the way, and we've talked about this a couple of times, but for the way that we've historically thought about sales in any capacity, which is primarily a white man selling to a white man, et cetera, down the line. What would you say, or what do you say to people, men, women, humans, that both get what you're trying to do and shift? And also, what would you say to those people that are like, they feel so strongly rooted and safe and secure in the old way, the old paradigm? Mm -hmm. What do those conversations look like too? I think a lot of the pushback comes from a place of fear. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just remind myself that it it often is not malicious. Like it is, it is a fear-based response. And so one of the things I lead with in the conversation, particularly when I use that line, like historical sales training was made by cishet white men for cishet white men to sell to cishet white men. People get really angry. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I didn't say what they created was bad. Right. I didn't say we should stop using it. All I'm saying is that this is a call to make space for new and different perspectives. All I'm saying is that we can take everything we have and we can build upon it with an intention to incorporate diverse perspectives and to acknowledge that this wasn't made for the type of sellers that we have in the market today. So that's where I would start the conversation that like nobody's attacking you, nobody's saying it's bad, but it's just, it's time for something more and new and different. And that doesn't necessarily mean better. It just means Yes. And what else? Yes. And hear that to all the cishet white men, we have space for you. We are not trying to cast you aside. And if you fight us, we will leave you behind. (laughs) And maybe that doesn't land for you. But like, for me, what that means is come with us or get out of the way. Yeah. We'll make room for you until you try to stop us. And then there's a different conversation. But my place in this life is to lead with love and light, my high vibration to include and make space for you. And if you choose to lean into that, we're going to do amazing things together beyond your wildest dreams and mine. Mm. But let's stop siloing ourselves and making it about power over one another. It's about linking arms together and call it Pollyanna, call it, call it woo, call it whatever. It is the humane way to include one another going forward so that we can, we build way more together than we do by ourselves. It's true. I often think about the power of calling people in instead of calling people out, but that does not mean that I'm going to not state facts Yes, because it ruffles somebody's feathers. Yes. Yes. My job is to break the status quo is my sacred calling is to break the status quo, to make more space for myself. And in making more space for myself as a woman in sales, make more space for all other women. Yes. And build that generational wealth that is our birthright to call in. So 
you're exactly right. And it's not our responsibility to help those whose feathers are ruffled to feel safe. That might be their work to do. So again, all of this is true together. No one's, you know, no one way. And I think like we're saying there's no one way to proceed, but make space. Yeah. Leslie, where do we find you? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's my primary channel. And I have another big goal this year, uh, getting to 50,000 folks in my LinkedIn community. I'm also on like YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, at B2B sales coach. And if folks prefer video content, I have quite a tidy little following on TikTok at sales tips talk. So I am out there sharing my knowledge every single day. I post somewhere to share that knowledge so that we can all lift up together. You've inspired me to do, you're the third or fourth person that's mentioned YouTube this week. So, okay. I'm getting little pings. Like, let me look into that. So closing remarks as we start to wind down. Two things. One is maybe a sentiment because I, for most of my life, was a woman that believed there was only one space at the table. And I believed that it wasn't safe to collaborate with women because they were going to take that one space from me. And it took me a really long time to get to a point where I stopped fighting for the one space men made for me and started fighting for more space. So one thought coming out of this incredible discussion is that like, remember that a lot of women might not be where we are. And I maybe on a more personal note, I am so excited and feel so privileged to be on the other side of that. And then to also be at a place in my life where I can create the spaces and the conversations that I so desperately sought earlier in my career and could never find. We're creating the infinite table. Mm. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Amy.